Here we go. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Maddie Wagner. I am the Digital Marketing Specialist with Johnson Consulting Group. Today we have Nelson Tuleen, Director of Business Consulting Services at JCG, and Stephanie Dunn, President of SBA Lending at Incredible Bank. Stephanie and Nelson are here to talk about applying for PP loans, calculating eligibility, and what steps you can take now. Just as a reminder, feel free to type questions into the chat box on your control panel during the presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And uh, with that, Nelson, take it away. Thank you, Maddie. So Stephanie, we find ourselves back here again. Um, a few months ago, we covered uh, the first draw on the PPP, and um, we're back here to really cover, uh, this webinar will cover three parts for everyone out there. We will recap the PPP first draw, and we'll break and have some Q&A for anybody that has questions. Uh, then we'll continue on with the uh, PPP second draw, Again, we'll break in case somebody has specific questions about that. And finally, Stephanie will wrap up, I think is probably the, the big piece of this is what's available and what are the opportunities to grow with the SBA loans. Um, before we do begin though, I, um, I talk with clients every day and I must say I'm, I'm forever and eternally grateful from a funeral professional just to say uh, thank you to all the men and women out there doing just an extraordinary job. I know in the, the last surge here that we're experiencing, um, people are, are working beyond, I think what a lot of them felt were their normal means and um, that's not taken lightly by those of us that are here to support you. I just see that you know, um, you don't have to go it alone um, through Johnson Consulting. We do have free consulting services available. If you want to, we'll be sending out information after the webinar. Um, so whether you're a client or not, you can gain some free consulting and simply sign up through Calendly for that. And um, I know firsthand that we reach out often to Stephanie to get the latest and greatest on uh, information about loans and the PPP. And I'm pretty sure um, she's more than willing and, and available to you for whatever your needs are. So Stephanie, hello. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Um, we'll start off first of all, again, with the uh, PPP first draw. And I know as I've read through the information, I think it's important for everybody to understand and, and they've named it appropriately that there's a first draw and a second draw. Some people may say, well, why are we even talking about PPP first one? That's over and done with. And um, I think it's important for everybody to have that distinction that it is a two-stage process. So if for some reason you didn't participate in the first round of PPP, the first draw, um, you actually have to go through that process first before being eligible for the PP, PPP2. We'll have to figure out a, a way of saying that without getting tongue tied. Um, so for this, why don't you recap for all of us, Stephanie, just uh, what was the PPP first draw loan all about and what were the specific requirements and eligibility for that? So PPP1, we'll call it P1 and P2. So P1 uh, was initiated last year when COVID just hit, and it was to help small businesses maintain their payroll, even though they were shut down or their services were interrupted due to COVID. So there were certain requirements for that P1, payroll one, and uh, it, we had to maintain a certain number of employees uh, was a requirement and it had to be 60% for payroll and only not all entity types qualified. And so the good news on this new round, you call it second round of relief money, they have um, expanded the requirements for the P1. So if you did not get your PPP loan payroll loan last year, let's look at applying for one now. 
And so the requirements are you have to have less than 500 employees, but they've ex expanded it to now include nonprofits, veteran organizations, tribal concerns, self-employed individuals, sole props, and independent contractors, in addition to co corporations. So that is the, the nonprofit profits and the veterans and self-employed and sole props will certainly have a positive Im impact or at least allow our funeral home owners to have access to this capital that may not have had access last year. So that's one enhancement. And uh, I would say if, if you have, um, if you certainly have not applied for a PPP loan, uh, I would encourage everyone to go ahead and apply for one now and see if you can get that round one of PPP, which is payroll, uh, a payroll uh, enhancement for COVID relief. And again, for everyone, no time to wait on that because the deadline is March 31st, correct? Correct, exactly. So that had, uh, the, the PPP one uh, basically have access to this bucket of money first. So they'll get approved and funded first by the SBA. I know a lot of people that I've spoke to, and I, that was a lingering conversation going back uh, between their accountants, their CPAs, uh, where they were wondering what the tax implications of the P1 draw. Can you speak to that? And of course, uh, you know, double check with Johnson, your accountant, and made to on the tax implications. But yeah, they they have enhanced the pro program so that the PPP money and the for, if you had a PPP loan that was forgiven is not a taxable event. Correct. So that's a positive. And um, I know there's it seems like there's almost a weekly uh, update on the forms that are going out. Um, can you clarify just which form is meant for the P1 draw forgiveness? So the, I think that if you have um, included the links in this webinar, and if not, maybe we can get it to everyone. So there is a, a different application for the P1 and the P2 to apply for the loans. And then there's a specific application for the P1 forgiveness and the P2 forgiveness. So it's all uh, outlined in each application exactly what you'll need to submit to your lender. And uh, they have made it a lot easier than it was last year to apply for your forgiveness. And for loans under 150,000, which is the majority of our small business owners, uh, it, it is a, a one pager forgiveness application and they, it, they have really streamlined it. So they, they, the goal is they want to get this relief money into the hands of business owners and they wanna make it as quick and streamlined as possible. So please don't be intimidated by the forms uh, because they really have tried to simplify them. So it, it has been working well. Um, while you said that, I, uh, I shared the screen that we have available, I believe. Um, and uh, for anybody that wants, there's a, a great list of links to uh, all kinds of information and more importantly, a quick link to forms and things like that that you'll need. Um, we'll give you some information here at the end of the program to, um, to see how you can look and get that. Let's go back to Stephanie. Um, so uh, I don't see any questions coming up at this point right now. Again, I think uh, for the most part, probably a lot of people uh, feel as though they they have the PP1 down. Again, I just to stress the fact that it's a two-step method. And if you're thinking, oh good, I'll get on the PP2 uh, gravy train there, you really have to complete the first one and go through the motions on that first. So let's turn our attention then to uh, the second draw. And um, the second draw allows for money to be used for more things than it did the last time. Can you go through that? Correct, yes. So uh, the second draw allows for payroll, but then it also allows for uh, worker protection costs related to COVID impacts. So if uh, you have uninsured property damage caused by land looting or vandalism or certain supplier costs and expenses for operation. Uh, so this has significantly helped the restaurant business owners and hotel owners who had inventory that went bad 
And so this now second PPP2, let's call, uh, can the proceeds can be used to cover those losses. And accommodation and food service sector have been, have been the, the biggest uh, recipients of this new P2 round. Um, another extra layer with regards to calculating the amount of PP loan that you can get, um, for the vast majority of people, it's still staying with the two and a half percent, but there are specific people that are getting a little better uh, uh, multiplication factor. And although you would think that it wouldn't maybe apply to funeral service, uh, there are a lot of funeral home cemeteries out there that do have food service attached. So um, if you wanna just share that information as well. Exactly. So if you get this P2 loan, you can use the proceeds for payroll as well as any uh, expenses that you've had, uh, supplier expenses or uh, write-off expenses that you've had for the catering or the food portion of the business, certainly. And then the biggest difference with the P2 round, and I know we're going to get to this soon, is, and I think this will have the biggest impact on our funeral owners is uh, the calculation. P1 was just the calculation of what was your 12 month payroll will give you two times payroll. This P2 now, it's not, the requirement is you have to show a 25% decline in gross receipts since COVID. So there are a couple of ways to calculate that if you wanna get into that, Nelson. Yeah, perfect segue. That is exactly what I want to share with everybody. Um, so we know this firsthand in working with our clients. Um, and just for anybody out there listening that are Johnson Consulting clients, uh, reach out to your consultant or your accountant, and we can easily calculate that quarter over quarter com uh, comparison that we're talking about. Uh, but this is a big big piece. I think it's probably, uh, regrettably, one of the things that are going to keep a lot of funeral homes uh, from eligibility just because um, sales averages took a dive, but uh, due to call volume in most cases, um, you had to have a significant drop off to see a 25% reduction in, uh, in gross receipts. Um, that being said, uh, if you do establish that you've got a 25% loss, um, do you want to talk to everybody as far as what they'd want to do or be prepared to demonstrate? Sure, yeah. And so they, they've tried to open up the how to analyze the drop. So you can pick any quarter in 2020 and compare it to to the, that same quarter in 2019 for that 25%. So there are the, the one-off quarters like Q2 maybe uh, uh, doesn't compare from a uh, 2020 perspective to 2019. And if you show that 25% reduction in Q2 2020 versus Q2 2019, then you're eligible. So that is the biggest difference in this round is you have to show a 25% reduction. So it could be the full year 2020 versus 2019, or you can pick a quarter 2020 versus 2019. And then for businesses that did, this was one interesting addition, businesses that did not exist in 2019, let's say it's a new business, it didn't exist in 2019, they're gonna look at your 2020 quarters and you can pick one quarter Q3 or Q4 compared to Q1 and Q2 2020. So you can just use your 2020 quarterly financials if you didn't exist in 2019. And then uh, if you do qualify, then it's two and a half times your average monthly payroll in 2019. And if it's a seasonal business, it could be a seasonal trailing 12 months. But so you're gonna take your average monthly payroll and you're gonna multiply it by two and a half and that's the loan amount you apply for. So it's almost, you have to check two boxes. Box one is, can I show a 25% reduction? And then box two is, here's my monthly payroll, multiply it by two and a half. So it, it's, they try to make that as simple as possible. And again, just for clarity, they're talking uh, gross returns, gross receipts. Um, it's not your 
profitability at the end. It's just uh, top line revenues coming in is what they're looking at. Um, here's a question I know that somebody brought to me is um, if you received PPP one money, does that go against money coming in as far as that being income? No. So uh, as we alluded to earlier, if you received PPP money and it was forgiven, you do not count that as income to be taxed. No. And uh, the next question I have for you, and I just, I guess I want to make sure that everybody is aware of it. I think the detail behind it is, is probably too much for us to get into on, on this particular webinar, but just to speak to the fact that um, there are differences with regards to the type of business structure and how you would apply. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so most, uh, they've opened up the type of entities that are allowed. So if it's an S Corp or C Corp or nonprofit, those are all eligible now for this P2. And uh, one of the things that I noticed is partnerships uh, have to be treated as a collective entity. It's not like, you know, if you and I were in partnership, you can't apply and then I apply separately, you're still considered a, a joint venture there, so. Exactly, and if you have contractors, you pay out 1099 contractors, the contractor would apply themselves. It wouldn't be you applying for them. Do you know if um, a calendar versus a fiscal year affects anything? Yeah, I read something somewhere. Uh, you just have to be able to show your trailing 12. So you can tell the bank that it's a, you're on a calendar year versus a fiscal or vice versa. Uh, and you alluded to this before too, but uh, in calculating the payroll protection amount, um, you can refer to different years. You wanna clarify that for everyone? Yes, you can use your payroll, average monthly payroll in 2019, or you can use your average monthly payroll in 2020. And if you're seasonal, you can use your uh, combination 2019-20, but it has to be 12 consecutive months. Perfect. Well, we're at the point of uh, looking at some questions coming in and I see up at the top, um, I see the first draw forgiveness form is dated 1-19-21. Is that the final we have been waiting for? Yes, if it's dated 2021, yes, that's it. And uh, there too, what we'll do to try to eliminate the confusion, um, we'll send out that list that I just shot up there on the screen before. Anyone that's uh, enrolled in this, we'll just be sending that out to you uh, after the webinar is over. Uh, next question, uh, this is from Scott. Is that payroll for 2019 or 20? I think you answered this, but go ahead. Yeah, you could use your average monthly payroll in 2019 because it was likely higher. I don't know, it depends. But yes, you can use your average monthly payroll in 2019 or your average monthly payroll in 2020. And uh, here's somebody just asking for some clarification and I'll just state it so that we can reemphasize it. I thought you had to show a reduction in two quarters at a minimum, but you all said, it says here two again. It's one quarter. So if you can take, let's say Q2 2020 versus Q2 2019. And if you show that 25% reduction in 2020 over 2019, you're eligible. So it's one quarter uh, year over year. Yeah, so you're again, one quarter, but the comparable quarter for for each respective year. Exactly. Uh, when Here's another question uh, coming in from Raphael. Uh, when calculating the 25% decline in gross receipts, do you use an accounting accrual basis or a cash basis? And nothing, that might be a good, uh, good ask for you, but from a bank perspective, we're just looking at gross sales. So the fir first line on your business tax return, let's say. So gross sales. Yeah, I, I, that's what I believe too. It's gonna be the receipts, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, for those in funeral service, the statement of goods and services, the final bill, uh, that's gonna be what you're basing that on. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then another question in, will PPP second draw be forgivable? Yes, yes. And so if you look at that, uh, the links that Nelson has and we'll send to the group, when you uh, pull up that PPP2 loan application, the second or third page walks you through what you'll need to gather when you submit your for your forgiveness. So as long as you use your PPP2 money for payroll and then those other allowable expenses, you can submit for the forgiveness. So we'll go into our uh, that that kind of exhausted our current questions there. So let's um, let's move into SBA loans. That's that's really again just to give you a quick commercial again. There you're the president of the SBA loans there at uh, Incredible Bank. So they're really you know from my standpoint, there's no higher authority than to give us the inside scoop on that. Um, I think too, as you talk through uh, what's available out there, I think a lot of people would gain from some of the examples that you have. I, obviously you can't share specifics, but I think a lot of people would say, oh gosh, I never even thought about using it that way. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and the same as, as we said last year in that first round of PPP, PPP is for payroll. And, and if you can get it, great. If you're eligible, please apply. And, and then make sure you gather all the documents to submit for your forgiveness. But that payroll is just two and a half times payroll. What we see a lot right now is people need that. So certainly apply for that. But they also have other pressing needs. And especially here in funeral. So several times a day, we have customers across the country and funeral homeowners across the country needing to add a retort, needing to expand their crematory services, needing to bring on different service offerings, expand their facilities, build out the facility for the crematory addition, and then just um, expanding on equipment, needing to uh, enhance their technology at the firm. So we have a lot of requests above and beyond this payroll need. So the new COVID package uh, now includes on new SBA loans. After February 1st, the government has waived the SBA guarantee fee. And that was pretty sizable. It was about you know two and a half to three and a half percent of the loan amount. So that's waived now. So you have no origination fee on an SBA loan. And again, you can use that as the regular SBA loan for working capital, for equipment, to expand your facility and update your facility or add uh, these additional offerings. And, uh, and it also, these new SBA loans, you can get up to six months principal and interest payments made for you by the government for the first six months. And those are capped up at 9000 a month. So you have access to this regular and SBA loan that can provide you with 500,000, for example, if you need to add a crematory and you will have your first six months payments made up to $9,000 a month and the origination fee from the government is waived. So really enhance the access to capital and the costs associated with this capital now have completely gone away and your payments made for you for six months. So that's that has been a really, uh, huge advantage in this round here. Um, something I want to just clarify that we didn't say on the, the second draw of the PPP and to kind of lead into a question here too is um, the deadline for the second draw is also March 31st. So people may be thinking, well, we said that for the PP1, it's also for the PP2. Uh, with that in mind, I would think that um, if your first step to getting a, a second draw is exhausting your opportunities on the first one, you're almost probably applying for them simultaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, but, and you know, one requirement though of the P2 is you have to have um, submitted or at least evidenced that you used P1 for the allowable uses and that it will be forgiven. So keep that in mind. So if you get P1, make sure you're using it for 60% payroll and those allowable uses. And you're going to have to document that when you submit for forgiveness that you used it as outlined to in order to get the P2. And I know some people back when there was the questionable part about being forgiven or not, there were people that had excess and they gave it back. 
um, uh, a stipulation for the second draw is if you did give back some of your PPP one dr first draw money, you actually have to reapply and exhaust that opportunity before moving on to the second draw. So again, gateway to draw two is exhausting everything with uh, first draw, uh, but both their deadlines are March 31st. Uh, with regards to deadlines, anything applying to SBA loans that there's a application time frame or any any special benefits that are running out? Well, and same with the the March thirty first deadline. This uh, six months payments made for you and the government guarantee fee waived. We're going to want to if you if you have thought about adding to your facility or even expanding and buying another firm, now's the time to do it because there is still a possibility that this government relief package runs out. And we all experienced this last year when everyone rushed to get a PPP loan and they ran out of money and they had to go back and reapply to, uh, for the government to refund the program. So I would say time is of the essence for everything right now. You wanna get your applications in and so that at least you have your applications in process and you have an approval in hand and then uh, you can close afterwards. But you want to have your application approval in hand uh, just because this thousands of small businesses have already submitted their applications. So you want to make sure you get in the queue. We've got another question that just came in and some of these questions we understand. Um, if people don't always join right at the first part or they have to step away to take a phone call. I think this is a, a repeat, but well worth uh, reinforcing. Is there an advantage for an independent firm that did not apply for the first rounds of PPP? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm thinking you've said this to me several times that people that didn't get it the first round kind of go to the front of the line. Yes, exactly. Yes, if those who did not get a PPP loan yet will are, are going first so if you are, are able now to apply for a ppp loan please go ahead and submit and if you were not eligible the first time around or you just didn't do it the first time around go ahead and submit now so that you can get that ppp one uh, goes first in this uh, program and then once you've received your ppp one and and you've used those funds accordingly then you can apply for your ppp two um, we talked about maybe if you could share some uh, examples of people that um, I, I know you shared some with me again uh, anonymously, but um, some advantages they've had. I can tell you from my perspective, we can see through Performance Tracker for our clients, um, there's been about a 25% uh, uptick uh, in direct cremation out of total cremation. And cremation in general has accounted for much of the increased call volume. And more and more people are thinking about maybe I should have a retort of my own or they want to expand. Um, I always say too, again, you got the possibility with this forgiveness where you could even get something up and running and potentially have positive cash flow coming before you make your first payment on the loan. Um, are there any other inspiring uh, or other things that you've heard or people have come to you for help? Yeah, certainly, exactly. I mean, when you think about being able to borrow money right now with interest rates still at a 30 year low, uh, as you're borrowing money with interest rates at a 30 year low, and then you have no fees to close on your loan, and then you get six months P&I payments made for you. Uh, so you're right, you'll, you'll cover six months of that retort expansion and you'll you'll already uh, have covered the cost of putting that in in your first 12 months with only having made half of the year required payments. So it's certainly the most uh, opportune time right now to expand your services or continue to increase your operations as needed uh, by inventory, by equipment, uh, if, you, if there's family succession that was on the horizon, now is the perfect opportunity to maybe really look at that seriously and see if there's a time right, that's more uh, appropriate to do it now, just because of these huge uh, cost savings. And that will have great impact on all of us long term. So uh, timing might be, uh, might be different now for you, given this uh, access to capital at such low rates and low costs. 
Here's uh, here's one that many people probably won't believe that it's not a plant, but <laughs> somebody has actually asked, is there an advantage to working with Incredible Bank rather than a local bank? And uh, take that opportunity for a commercial, Stephanie. That's great. Well, whoever asked that question gets the, the VIP parking spot. <laughs> um, I would say um, if you have a, a bank you've worked with and you have already received a PPP loan from your local bank, go back to that same bank to get another your next PPP loan because they already have your stuff. They should have forgiven your first PPP loan and they should be the ones to do your PPP2 loan. Regarding a regular SBA loan, I would certainly say if, if you don't have a direct close relationship with your banker to be able to structure this correctly and they understand funeral, not just gave you a PPP loan, but they certainly understand the funeral industry and how to structure a funeral home loan, reach out to a funeral lender like us here. We have been in the funeral business for 20 years and we understand the nuances and it makes a huge difference on how you structure your debt at your firm. And um, being in this industry for as long as we've been in, we have helped hundreds of businesses across the country and take great pride in being able to provide that really specific skill uh, counseling, if you would, on how to structure your debt and how to best borrow money. Because uh, it could mean the difference of your monthly mortgage payment being double uh, what it could be uh, by not working someone who understands the uh, funeral structures. So yeah, we have a team of 25 people here that is dedicated to lending to funeral home owners across the country. We've been doing it for a really long time. And so anyone who's worked with us, you'll be working with the same people and we're uh, very passionate as we are a small privately owned bank uh, like every, any other small business and owned by a wonderful family that has owned this bank since the 60s and uh, has been bean farmers since the 60s in Wisconsin, near you, Nelson, <laughs> and uh, continue to be bean farmers. And uh, so we have uh, all come together and we are very passionate and excited to do what we do every day. So they're truly our bean counters. <laughs> exactly, we're the bean bank bean counters, right? I know, I thought that was just the cutest thing, but yeah, uh, we try to be as accessible, as thoughtful and uh, proactive as possible. You know, I always tell people that money is a commodity and you can borrow money anywhere, but it's about the relationship you have, uh, being able to get what you need quickly, but then also being able to uh, have access to the most thoughtful, solutions, most competitive prices. So you don't have to worry about shopping around. You just know right away that you're taken care of. Just like your CPA, you know, your CPA always has your best interest at heart. So does the banker. So you shouldn't have to worry about shopping around if you really have a, a real good relationship with your bank. And, and I would say that too. I think anyone in funeral service, they realize and understand the importance of relationships and working with your local banker. I, I will share this though, in at least two circumstances with clients that I've worked with this last year is uh, I believe their local banker was just overwhelmed and, um, and they dissuaded them from uh, applying for PPP. Um, and in those cases, I encourage them to to look elsewhere, again, not driving business away from the local guy, but um, make sure that you're looking out for your best interest too. If somebody says they don't think it's a good idea, um, you know, free money is always a good idea. So uh, be sure to look into it. Mm -hmm. All right, we've just gotten a flurry of additional questions here. So that's great. Um, are you allowed to apply for additional PPP one loan if you if you could have received a higher loan amount, for instance, using the 24 month payroll amount instead of eight months, your loan amount would have been higher. Is there any defensible way to move revenue from one quarter? Oh, let's take those two. I think they're two separate questions. So you, uh, you take the first one about uh, the payroll. Right. No, you have to use your 2019 average monthly payroll or your 2020 average monthly payroll, but it, could, it only can be 12 consecutive months. And so what they really want to do is provide relief to direct COVID impact. 
So that's that's the point there. Um, so it can't be the 24 month period. And so here's a second part of that question. And this is, is there any defensible way to move revenue from one quarter to another quarter to qualify for the 25% reduction? And I think that may in fact uh, hide the answer to the question we had earlier about accrual versus cash. Um, I think that's, that is probably the response is that the, uh, when the sale occurs, whether cash exchanges hands or not, um, that would be an accrual that, um, or a cat where, where you're gonna have to count it when the transaction was made. Right. Any right. more thoughts on that, Stephanie? Mm -hmm, you're right, exactly. It's gross receipts per quarter. Here's another one. Can you give a quick difference between uh, SBA 7A and 504? Mm -hmm, yes. So there are three programs within the SBA business loans. There's an SBA 7A, and then there's a 504 loan, and then there's a USDA loan. So I'll go backwards. And the USDA loan is for businesses located in a metropolitan surrounding area of less than 50,000 people, so more rural. Um, and a 504 loan is primarily used to purchase just commercial real estate. So it would be best uh, used for, let's say, if you're buying a medical clinic and uh, it's a $5 million purchase of just the building. Um, it, you cannot use a 504 loan to fund goodwill or uh, intangibles or working capital. It's just for a hard asset, primarily a building. An SBA 7A loan is a business loan geared more towards a business need. So uh, uh, it is much more applicable in the funeral industry because when you are buying a funeral home, it would be land, building, equipment, and goodwill. So because of that goodwill blue sky piece, you wouldn't be able to finance the total purchase with a 504 loan. You would have to use a 7A loan because the 7A loan is a business loan and you don't need to technically be fully secured by a building to get a business loan. You can use a 7A loan just to say, borrow $250,000 of working capital to buy, you know, to, to buy inventory or to buy equipment or just to invest back in the company and marketing and so forth. So a 7A loan is used to, for overall business needs and a 504 is used primarily for a building only. Um, and then the term differences are a 7A loan is a 25 year term, 25 year amortization. A 504 loan is a 20 year loan, 20 year amortization. And then a 504 loan is split up between half of it is an SBA loan, and then the other half is a conventional loan. So that's the, so you have two loans in a 504, and you have one loan in a 7A. Um, we have very you know a one pager cheat sheet that shows you side by side the different programs and what would be more uh, useful for you depending on what your need is. Stephanie, I know you talked about it late or earlier, but when you, we start talking in all these uh, numbers and letters, it reminded me to go back and just reemphasize again. In the first draw earlier in the year, there were limitations to nonprofits and things like that, which now they've been um, in, included in this. Just for clarification, if earlier in the year you couldn't have applied for first draw because you were not in one of these eligible categories that has been opened up now. Are you going back and applying for PPP first draw? Yes, yes, correct. You apply for P1 first. So again, just for everybody to know that that expanded the first draw, it's not that the second draw includes it and first draw did not. So again, uh, rule of thumb for all of this is go back and start it at the first spot in the first draw, but uh, where you may not have been qualified previously, um, there's a lot of, well, uh, Stephanie listed them before. And again, the information we'll share with you later uh, includes links 
for you to look up and see who else has been uh, extended that eligibility. Um, can you, uh, let's see, what kind of documentation is required, payroll, quarterly comparisons, et cetera, to verify the financial amounts being reported? Who will request and receive these? So the documentation for payroll is either your payroll. So if you run it through a payroll company, you can just show us the 12 month payroll. And then uh, there is an opportunity to give us your 941s and so we can, uh, or your tax returns. So we could see your total payroll expense for 2019. Uh, you probably don't have your 2020s together just yet. So I would say 2019 tax business tax returns, and then your just payroll report for 2019. Um, here's a question you might have to do a little interpretation or, or put it into the context you think it's best. So uh, it says, so commissions are not eligible as payroll, correct? From our understanding, it's 12 month payroll. So it's regular payroll because commissions would be, you know, it, you could, they could be incentives, they could be bonuses, they could be all kinds of different di deferred comp or variable comp. We would look at just the payroll, average monthly payroll. Um, if you if there's anything that is significant to include and your commissions are significant, let's take a look at that. I like to you know it could be a, a case by case basis. We have not seen a lot of uh, submissions right now that had significant commissions that had really changed the loan amount that much. But yeah, please do if you have that, send it to us and we'll take a look and let you know what the calculation would be. It would be something our underwriters would look at. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question for whoever mm -hmm. uh, submitted it, because uh, I think, too, in the world of pre-need, uh, depending on how they're being compensated, um, mm -hmm. although I think in the first go around, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Stephanie, they would have been considered as, if they were solely commissioned, they would be looked at as a 1099. Correct. Yeah, it would have to be a W-2 employee that you paid a commission to that would be included in the payroll uh, summary. So in the case where some people have a split compensation, they might have a base, uh, but mm -hmm. then the, the uh, sales agent uh, pre-need person gets a commission on top of it. That, so again, um, reach out to Stephanie uh, so she can research that and, and get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, next question is two and a half times average monthly payroll for 2019 or 2020. You might wanna just recap that again. Yes, correct. So it's either or. You can use your two and a half times average monthly payroll for 2019 or your average monthly payroll for 2020. In most cases, your 2019 payroll is higher than 2020 because you maybe weren't at full capacity. So you would use your 2019 number, but you could use the higher number. Here's another excellent question, and I'm afraid I, I wouldn't know the interpretation of this. Maybe you do, um, but somebody asked about cash advances being included in gross receipts. Yeah, and we've had different variations of that. Let's say, for example, you're a construction company. Do you include your work in progress if you haven't really received the money? So again, that's all case by case. I would say submit your documentation and we can look at it together with our underwriter. Uh, but cash advances, if you earned it and, it and it was recorded as a receipt, then technically you would have to include it. Okay, yeah, because, uh, you know, for some people that could be a major mm -hmm. differential there. So, um, yeah. and, and it, I would only offer up this though, is if your cash advance um, policy has not changed dramatically year over year. I see that when we do budgets for funeral homes, uh, the amounts wouldn't change. So if you do include cash advances, and especially when you're you're comparing those receipts in a in a comparative quarter year over year, and again, just think about it that way. Uh, for those of us in a northern climate, there might be 
different expenses for cemeteries for snow clearing and things like that. But you're always comparing a quarter to the similar quarter of the other year. And uh, I venture to guess, however, the cash advances would be interpreted in the gross receipts, uh, the differential between the two uh, probably is marginal at best, I would think. Um, is it true that we can apply through different providers? I was told that we can file multiple times through different lenders. Once a file number has been assigned, then the other applications become null. Well, I, you don't, you could, yes, you can only get one loan as number one, but if you, it's just a lot of work for you to just apply with a bunch of different lenders because it's the same exact application and it's the same exact documentation. So if you want to save yourself some time and, and energy, uh, work with the bank you've worked with before on the P1 and get a P2 and go through their system. If you have not applied before, um, see if you can establish a relationship or have a conversation with someone versus just going you know, online. Maybe that would not provide so much um, confidence in the application. But if you've submitted your application and you submitted all the correct information and you're eligible, whoever you submitted it with should be processing it. So it's not, uh, if you're eligible, you get the loan. It's, it's very simple. So if, if you don't have a relationship and you're not feeling like the, whoever you're, you're sending your information to is responsive, let's say within a day or two, then yes, I would say go somewhere else. But if you submitted your application, they responded back saying, we received your application, you're being processed, there's no need to continue sending it to other lenders. Uh, here's another question uh, that I've received, and uh, I'll let you answer it though, Stephanie. Um, if you've got multiple locations within a, a firm, you know, say you have seven locations, um, you don't treat them independently in applying. It's always as the parent firm, correct? Right. You would get one PPP loan, and we have customers who have multiple locations, multiple entities. If you have multiple businesses, then yes, you can apply for a PPP loan for each business. But if it's one business with just a few rooftops, then it would just be the one entity applying, the overall entity. It's up to 2 million in total PPP loan amount that you can get. So it, it's the, the loan amount that you can apply for is pretty great and should be able to satisfy your two month payroll. And the same thing for calculating those cash receipts. Uh, you could have a small branch firm that does 30 calls a year. And if you had a bad year, you could be off 25% pretty easy in a quarter. Uh, but again, you can't treat the individual branch location. It's the complete parent firm. Mm -hmm. Unless um, it's a different entity, a different business. Correct, yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you give a range of rates? I would assume we're talking about SBA loans. So can you give a range of rates? Is there a reprice after a term? And the third part of that question, any prepayment penalty? So this would be on the regular SBA loan. So if you need to borrow money to add a retort, for example, and you want to borrow $500,000 for a crematory addition, uh, it would be, um, if, if it's real estate secured, it would be a 25 year loan, 25 year term. The rates right now ballpark are let's say 5% interest rate on 25 year term. And the prepayment penalty, it's a three year prepayment penalty. That's 5% in year one, 3% in year two, 1% in year three. And then after year three, it's zero for the rest of the 23 term, 23 years. So you would only, uh, have to worry about a prepayment penalty if you want to pay off your loan in full in the first three years. In those first three years, you can pay down up to 25% in each year with no penalty as well. Okay, well, I think we've exhausted our questions and uh, you certainly answered all of mine, Stephanie. I can't begin to thank you enough for doing this with us. And I would venture to guess there's a, there's a sequel in the making. Oh, I think oh, somebody else is just saying thank you very much. So um, it's nice. I think we touch upon an interesting and important item with these webinars and looking forward to the next one that we have. 
I think uh, at this point, Maddie, we'll turn it back to you. I will share this screen one more time so people can see the list of, uh, of information that we have available to share with them. I'm not sure in this in this format, I can never tell if you can see it or not, but but uh, take it away, Maddie. Sure thing. Oh, and there it goes. I think it's popping up. I think you got you got the hang of it there, Nelson. There we go. <laughs> well, thank you too. Honestly, thank you, Nelson. And thank you, Stephanie, so much. This has been amazing. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We will be sending out an email. Um, most likely on Monday, but at the latest, it will be going out on Tuesday with all the information that you've heard today. So with all these links, um, as well as any other forms, um, once again, if you have any questions, please remember to email us at info at johnsonconsulting.com or please use, Nelson mentioned, uh, we are going to be um, adding a Calendly link in there. So please make sure to think about that stuff as well when we email that out to you. So thank you guys once again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Stay safe, stay healthy. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Talk soon. <laughs>